、えー、それでは帝国になりましたので日本は。Together with online distribution, and the organizer is recording the symposium. May we ask participants to put the smartphone on the silent mode and please refrain from recording the symposium for your personal purposes? Later on, the, the web of the JIIA is going to make this program available. We have simultaneous interpretation throughout the program between Japanese and English. Channel one is for A、Japanese channel two, yeah, this is channel four, channel two. For those of you online, can choose、uh, the, the language by clicking the button on the screen among the original language and the English and the Japanese. As we start the program, we are going to ask Mr. Sotaro Ozaki, a Director of Research Coordination at the Japan Institute of International Affairs, to address you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome all participants present here and those attending online. Thank you for the kind introduction. I am Director of Research Coordination at the Japan Institute of International Affairs. My name is Sotaro Ozaki. Thank you very much for joining us today on a Saturday, despite the rainy weather, for this public symposium titled. The San Francisco Peace Settlement and East Asia, a Contemporary Perspective. This symposium is jointly organized by the Japan Institute of International Affairs and the International Research Center for Japanese Studies. And I would like to say a few words on behalf of the JIIA. Since fiscal year 2017, our institute has launched a program to address issues related to territory, sovereignty, and history, and has conducted a number of research projects and symposiums. As part of this program, we held an international symposium titled The Formation of the San Francisco System from Occupation to Peace in Tokyo in October 2018. And a collection paper based on it, the San Francisco Peace Settlement and East Asia, was published by the University of Tokyo Press in March 2022, last year. And this is the book. Today's symposium is based on the publication of this collection of papers. And、uh, this symposium will attempt to reconsider. The historical significance of the San Francisco Peace Treaty, which has been studied mainly based on materials and US archives from the perspective of Japan, East Asia, and the international context, and to reassess the historical image of the formation of the post war East Asian regional order from multiple perspectives and in a comprehensive manner. Today's symposium will be attended by The senior visiting researcher at the Institute, Professor Yuichi Hosoya of Keio University, Professor Sumio Hatano, Director General of Japan Center for Asian Historical Records, National Archives of Japan, Professor Shin Kawashima of the Graduate School of Arts and Science, University of Tokyo, and from、uh, the co organizer, Professor Ayako Kusunoki, and the Professor Masahiko Nishimura, Institute and Researcher from the Internet Research Center for Japanese Studies. The San Francisco Peace Treaty was literally the cornerstone that defined how post war Japan should be at a time when the international order is in turmoil. We hope that today's symposium 
will deepen your interest in and contemplation of the post-war international order. I would like to invite you to visit the website of JIIA, where you will find many papers, symposium, and webinars on Japan's territory, sovereignty, and history. With these words, I would like to conclude my opening remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ozaki. Now, we would like to invite uh, Professor Yuichi Hosoi, a moderator of this uh, symposium, and a professor of Keio University, uh, to give us a explanation on uh, the collection of essays, also uh, the purpose of this symposium today. And uh, Dr. Hosoi is also going to serve as a moderator uh, for the discussion. So after his uh, remarks, he is going to take over the role of a moderator. Now, Dr. Hosoi, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My name is Hosoya with Keio University. I am also a senior urgent fellow at JIIA. And today, the theme is San Francisco of Peace Treaty and East Asia. And based upon this publication, we are going to dig deeper into San Francisco Peace Treaty. As Chia Ika, showed a very important remark about what history was all about. Uh, history uh, is a continuation of dialogue between the past and the present. So this dialogue means that when the present time changes, uh, the views and assessment of the past change. Regarding the San Francisco Peace Treaty in 1980s, a lot of excellent research was uh, conducted. However, uh, today, Japanese diplomacy is faced with so many difficult issues, and the international environment around Japan is changing dramatically. And also, a new di diplomatic documents have been published, and from various uh, uh, countries' perspective, especially uh, from uh, the viewpoint of East Asia, when we uh, once again revisit San Francisco peace treaty system, how can it be viewed, and how is it going to be uh, assessed differently from uh, the assessment and the review of the San Francisco treaty in the past? And for that purpose, we have the best uh, speakers in this symposium. Uh, they are going to give us reports one by one. Uh, so I would like to move on to the reports from my experts. The first speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Sumio Hata, no Director General of the Japan Center for Asian Historical Archive Records. Uh, Dr. Hata, no, please. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I have a slight cold, so please allow me to keep wearing a mask. So if you have difficulty uh, hearing uh, me, please uh, let me know. Uh, I prepared a, a short resume, a summary of my remarks, and as shown in the introduction part, uh, today the peace treaty system, as uh, Dr. Hosea mentioned, how should it be viewed? Uh, depends upon how we look at uh, the present time uh, where we are living. And from that uh, point of view, when uh, in relation to what when uh, the book was published, it seems that uh, the peace treaty system is now being destabilized significantly. Uh, first, uh, are the changes concerning uh, the discussion regarding repatriation and uh, compensation after the end of Cold War. Uh, one factor uh, is uh, uh, the issues of a compensation for individual victims. How should it be viewed? This uh, issue of a compensation for individual victims seems to be at the center of uh, discussion and discourse today. And the second point is how we should view and regard a war on Ukraine. As I uh, once again uh, come to this point later, uh, there seems to be a suspicion and doubts about uh, the universality of post-war international order behind this. And Russia and China, which were left out of the peace treaty uh, framework, may be seeking uh, imperialist order, which is on a dimension different from that of the international order uh, of the Western bloc uh, preconditioned uh, by uh, the peace treaty. 
uh, especially uh, the first point uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, seems to be the destabilizer of the uh, peace treaty system I see today. Then what has been this uh, uh, peace treaty system? Although this is a well-known notion, please allow me to go through this. In March 1952, the UN Senate uh, ratified the Treaty of Peace with Japan and the three uh, treaties, uh, uh, Treaty uh, of Security between Japan and United States, uh, Mutual Defense Treaty between the Philippines and United States, and the Treaty. All the three uh, treaties um, uh, grant U.S. military presence in the countries and define uh, the framework of U.S. involvement in the security in the East. Asia Pacific and the Japan US Security Treaty was the center of that framework. And the peace treaty system uh, uh, means a system which is uh, integrated the uh, whole of Japan US Security Treaty and the peace treaty with Japan. This uh, peace treaty system was realized when Japan chose to entrust the most crucial uh, element of a sovereign state, the security United States, and that choice. Uh, also meant that the United States bears the final responsibility of disarmed Japan uh, for its security. And uh, this uh, reduced the uncertainties in the East Asia, and also uh, it satisfied the neighboring states which sought uh, security against Japan uh, because of uh, the bitter experience of Japanese aggression. Also, it uh, solved Japanese security issues, and thus Japan-US security relationship was formed, and that was also supported by the United Kingdom. So such a peace treaty system, how was it formed in the first place? Uh, this is also something which is very well known to you. First, that the formation was led by the United States. However, uh, that was uh, formed through a multi-layered or bilateral negotiations, a multilateral code negotiation between the UK, the British Commonwealth, especially Australia and Japan. And that point was elaborated in the book we all wrote. Uh, what are the international background which define these negotiations? One is the communist threat in Asia. Uh, for instance, the Korean War and uh, Communist China's participation in the war. And second is uh, the concern about Japanese re-aggression. And the third is the two China issue. Number four is that moves of uh, um, China and the Soviet Union, and number five is the re-emergence of colonialism. Because of such factors entangled with each other, Japan as an independent uh, uh, country uh, has been gradually positioned as a member of the West. Um, uh, the, uh, there were many the preparatory steps to the peace treaty formation, uh, but um, from uh, uh, the 1940s to the 1951, uh, those uh, major international uh, factors seemed uh, to exert a big influence upon uh, the negotiation of the peace treaty. Aside from this, uh, security uh, treaty between Japan and the United States and the peace treaty with Japan uh, are inseparable with each other, but especially uh, the Treaty of Peace with Japan is the central piece of my remarks today. Now, the 20th century uh, peacemaking uh, is a, a framework uh, for post-war post settlement, uh, which solved uh, the there is problems arising from the war between the victorious and the defeat nations and brought an end to the state of war and also to recover stable relationship and 49 countries, including Japan, concluded this treaty of peace aside from the security treaties. And the peace treaty system I mentioned here means a, a bundle of a, a treaty and agreement systems that include the bilateral uh, peace treaties and uh, reparations agreements. And this uh, peace treaty system uh, was the foundation for solving uh, reparation claims arising from war and colonial rule, and also bring about the stability of the international order uh, together with the Japan-US Security Treaty in the Asia Pacific. And uh, this uh, peace treaty system uh, put a priority to the closer relationship between Japan and the United States and security issue. Uh, and as a result, it put on the back burner the post-war uh, settlement of uh, uh, territorial and reparations issues, which 
ought to be in the purpose of the peace treaty, and as a result, Japan faced difficulty coping with those uh, pending issues later on. The early drafts of the Allied peace plans clearly indicated Japan's possible borders on the map, clearly stating the names and destinations of individual islands, such as Habomai Shikotan, and the stating that there would be no disputes in the future. However, in the course of the shift to a majority peace, neither the ownership of Taiwan and the Iponfu Islands nor the ownership of Minami Karakuto and the Krill Islands had yet been decided, and the latter left the scope of Krill Islands in dispute. The reasons for this problem is that the Potsdam Proclamation did not specify the scope of the small islands to be left to Japan, and none of the countries that these islands were supposed to belong to became parties to the peace treaty with Japan. Even the independence of Korea did not specify which of the two Koreas that had already become independent in 1948. This left a question of the nationality of the former colonial population who were Japanese subjects unresolved. Okinawa was placed under U.S. administration with the assumption that it would be placed under the trusteeship of the United Nations, but it was not clear whether Japanese sovereignty would remain. Second is the issue is war responsibility. By the time of the peace settlement, the international military tribunals, Tokyo trials, and Class BC war criminals tribunals had been concluded. But how should it be positioned in the peace treaty? In the end, unlike the peace treaty with Italy, the San Francisco Treaty had no article that explicitly holds Japan responsible for the war, but only accepts the judgment of the International Military Tribunal. The peace treaty was based on the leadership responsible, but without settling who was uh, truly responsible for the war, according to the Article 12, whether it's the individual or, or, or the state, Japan focused its efforts on negotiation of the release of war criminals. The third issue is the, the, the reparation issue. All major allied nations renounced their right to claim reparation, but four Southeast Asian countries exercised the right, and Japan was forced to respond individually, leading to the conclusion of the bilateral treaties of peace and the reparation. Reparation negotiations were not merely bilateral, but were performed in conjunction with the three issues of restoring equilibrium and developing the international economic system, shaping and stabilizing regional order, and reforming domestic politics. They were handled from the perspective of stabilizing the peace regime. In particular, the U.S. saw these negotiations as a means of controlling Japan's Asian policy and became involved from multiple angles. Southeast Asian reparations were targeted at developing countries that were in the process of nation building. The economic cooperation approach modeled on Burmese reparation was quite effective. The difficult issue is the issues related to the former colonies, so-called separated areas. Japan's defeat in the war was accompanied by the dismantling of the empire and the loss of the colonies, making it difficult to deal with the Japanese-owned assets that remained in those areas. This is because the peace treaty system was not designed to deal with the colonial issue. That brought difficulty to Japan, in particular, negotiations for the normalization of diplomatic relations between Japan and ROK were difficult in relation to the disposition of Japanese property in the Korean Peninsula because of the issue of historical evaluation of the colonial rule. It required 15 years of negotiation. So we see that the, this peace treaty system 
for the, the territory and the history for the system that could deal with those issues. But as to the, uh, the individual compensations, the treaty system had another round of difficulty. A common feature of the treaties that make up the peace treaty system is that they adhere to the principle of mutual renunciation of claims for damages and losses suffered not only by nations, but also by citizens or individuals. No compensation to individual was a principle. Indonesia, for example, has made its policy clear that it will not provide individual compensation to those who suffered under the Japanese military. This is because Indonesia has taken the position that the issue has been resolved under the Japan-Indonesia Peace Treaty. However, in 1990s, post-war compensation issues such as the uh, uh, the wartime control for the women issue and the forced labor issue were raised. This, this is an issue between a state and individuals, not among the states. And China and South Korea were outside of the framework of the peace treaty, and they raised those issues. This was against the backdrop of the changing domestic and international situation, the end of the Cold War, and the, the shaking of the LDP dominant rule. In the case of the comfort women issue, why maintaining the peace treaty system, the Japanese government sought new responses from a moral standpoint such as the Peace and Friendship Exchange Plan and the Asian Women's Fund. But their effectiveness was limited as the issue spread worldwide as an international human rights and humanitarian issue of individuals. So there has been many cases of the trial brought about by victims uh, in individual in China and Korea. And the Supreme Court in Japan uh, said in 2007, rejected those cases based on the comprehensive San Francisco Peace Treaty framework theory that the Peace Treaty, which denied individual claims, extend not only to the bilateral peace treaties and compensation agreements, but also to the two joint declaration by Japan with China and the Soviet Union. This decision was an attempt to hold the ever increasing number of post-war compensation trials so that the individual, uh, the legal destabilizing the system. But the issue was not settled legally because of the, the those cases which happened more than 70 years ago. And the Supreme Court cast the issue on the people and the government of Japan. Supreme Court encouraged the, the defendants to respond voluntarily, and there were some cases of settlement. So the post-war process based on the peace treaty regime has not completed yet in the dimension of individual compensation issues. This was demonstrated by a 2018 South Korean Supreme Court ruling that ordered Japanese companies to pay compensation to Korean wartime laborers. So the South Korean judiciary did not deny the compensation to individuals. This was something particular. However, you may know that the subsequent judgment of the Korean judiciary has been changing or shaky. Conclusion, diplomatic records are increasingly being made public by the MOFAs uh, under the 30-year re release rule. It's covered now extends to 1990s. One of the most noticeable trends we see from these documents is that the, from the late 80s uh, to 90s, there has been general support 
to China's reform and open door policy and the Russia after the end of the Cold War after the collapse of the Soviet Union conducted by the Western countries. This was based on the expectation that if they advanced Western countries with their idea of a liberal international order spared no effort to provide support to Russia and China, they would naturally follow the same path and international cooperation would be assured. However, if these expectations are betrayed through the war in Ukraine, the peace regime supported by the liberal view of the international order may be severely shaken. This is the pessimistic view that I can share with you. Is that all for the first presentation? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Atano. So he has given us a very a wide framework uh, that uh, encompasses the subsequent reports. And also from the contemporary perspectives, uh, he mentioned uh, the war in Ukraine and uh, the confrontation between United States and uh, PRC. San Francisco Peace Treaty uh, excluded uh, uh, two major powers, and these two countries uh, are now rising as a threat and challenge to the international order. Uh, as a way uh, to understand such a contemporary issues, we once again recognize the importance of revisiting and reviewing San Francisco peace treaty system and what it means. I would like to turn to uh, Professor Kawashima. Uh, he is going to speak about uh, Taiwan uh, ROC and uh, the Beijing government uh, uh, in uh, his uh, report. I know uh, Professor, uh, Professor Kawashima, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is Kawashima speaking. Uh, I am one of the contributors to this book and, and a member of the editorial uh, board and I've been involved in the preparation uh, to the publication of this book. When we began, the war in Ukraine uh, uh, was uh, not afford and the confrontation between uh, the United States and uh, China was uh, uh, gradually on the rise. So looking back, we didn't expect to see such a big transformation as we see today. And um, uh, the issues in East Asia uh, were uh, the framework we were expecting uh, to cover in this book. And that's why it says East Asia. But as I stated in uh, the preamble, in this book, uh, this uh, peace treaty with Japan uh, provided uh, or served as the foundation for international order in post-war East Asia. And uh, the countries uh, who signed uh, the uh, San Francisco Peace Treaty, uh, mainly the Western uh, countries. Uh, the order of uh, the Western countries in the Western Pacific was shaped by this uh, treaty, and also it shaped uh, the post-war reintegration of Japan into an international society and community. Uh, five or six years ago, when we began to prepare our essays for this book, uh, we thought that it was very important to look at the significance of this peace treaty system. Uh, uh, with the, uh, the uh, rise of uh, China uh, in East Asia, uh, uh, the international order seems to be uh, changing. That was our understanding at the time. And also, as uh, uh, Dr. Hatano, uh, many issues uh, uh, came to the surface regarding the recognition of history. Uh, and in that context, uh, uh, this uh, peace treaty uh, uh, and the framework seems to be facing difficulties coping with the new uh, and pending issues. Such a destabilization of the San Francisco Peace Treaty system uh, was already uh, seen in the 2010s uh, and a competition uh, uh, between uh, United States and China became more apparent and uh, with the emergence of uh, war in Ukraine uh, 
the issues concerning San Francisco things really um, uh, seem to become uh, clearer and more evident. And I wrote chapter seven of this book uh, from 1945 to 1947, uh, in the early period after the end of World War II, uh, ROC, as there was no PRC then in China uh, uh, as ROC, how to proceed with the peace with Japan. Uh, uh, that was uh, the uh, title and uh, the contents of chapter seven. Uh, Uh, the America led the occupation and uh, peacemaking with Japan uh, met with a deep seated suspicion uh, by China, as we uh, wrote and read in uh, the discourse. The United States seemed to be casualed gradually uh, by Japan, and the uh, Chinese government seems to be. Uh, then uh, casualed by the United States. And uh, the, there was a domestic voice that China should uh, be uh, more demanding against uh, Japan. And uh, there was a, a backlash and criticism of uh, the government uh, of China uh, as uh, they thought that Chinese government was being casualed by the United States. And, but of course, there was a communist uh, a, in the background of such a voice in PROC. And a domestic voice that demanded the special treatment of China for instance, uh, more than uh, $5 billion or reparations were considered. And uh, um, uh, uh, the Chinese people demanded 50% of the repatriation payments and also the return of the goods confiscated by the Soviet Union and return of the Ryukyu or at least placed under the trusteeship and also Japanese territory should be minimized. And that was the argument in China from 1945 to 1947. And in 1990s, uh, the Chinese Civil War continued, uh, but the Kuomintang uh, uh, party uh, uh, left the mainland and uh, went to uh, ROC and there was the formation of PRC and because of such uh, internal turmoil, China was not able to take part in uh, the San Francisco conference. Uh, uh, but uh, Japan and ROC uh, uh, was uh, uh, then concluded uh, and uh, it conformed the San Francisco Treaty. But from uh, 1945 to 1970 to 1940. 6, 1948, uh, there were a lot of uh, changes uh, in the discussion concerning the uh, San Francisco um, uh, Treaty uh, preparation. And uh, this is a uh, very voluminous uh, changes taking place and I couldn't summarize all of them in my chapter. Now, San Francisco Peace Treaty System, whether I should use this term or not, then there is uh, disagreements over the use of this terminology, but at any rate, the Peace Treaty uh, with Japan and its and, uh, related uh, um, uh, treaties uh, uh, seemed uh, to form the international order uh, after the war and it formed a relationship uh, with Japan uh, and other countries. And uh, some uh, said that it signed but uh, didn't ratify and some countries and uh, didn't participate in the uh, treaty, but they formed a uh, different uh, uh, treaties with Japan. And as was uh, mentioned by Dr. Hadan earlier, Indonesia uh, signed but didn't ratify and separately concluded a treaty with Japan. And uh, there were uh, multiple um, treaties and agreements besides a peace treaty with Japan. And uh, uh, there are many ways to classify those uh, related uh, uh, treaties and agreements depending upon the contents, but many countries renunciated the uh, uh, reparations uh, claims. Uh, and uh, in conformity with uh, the uh, San Francisco Treaty, uh, some uh, uh, countries such as Southeast Asian four countries, uh, based upon what they understood from the San Francisco Peace Treaty, uh, reclaimed uh, the reparations and Burma, Indonesia, for instance, uh, concluding a treaty of peace with Japan. And uh, uh, also, uh, Korea, uh, for instance, uh, 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 concluded the treaty uh, in conformity with the San Francisco Treaty, but didn't refer to the reparations in uh, the text of the uh, treaty. But uh, the treaty uh, called on uh, parties to recall uh, the peace uh, treaty with Japan and the United uh, uh, 
uh, nations uh, charter. Korea was not party to the treaty with uh, Japan. Uh, therefore, uh, in uh, the convention treaty with Japan, uh, it called upon the parties to recall the San Francisco Peace Treaty. Uh, and uh, also, there were uh, treaties uh, which conformed uh, to the San Francisco Peace Treaty by using the word that uh, based upon uh, the Peace Treaty with Japan, uh, following the Peace Treaty with Japan. And uh, there are some uh, uh, provisions concerning the renunciation of patriation. Therefore, point number three and point number uh, two uh, uh, treaties seem to conform uh, uh, to uh, the Treaty of Peace with Japan. Uh, however, uh, uh, the uh, peace joint uh, communique uh, between Japan and PRC, what it says in 1972, it really uh, it had a stronger consciousness of uh, Japan uh, ROC uh, treaty. Uh, which renounced uh, the repatriation claims. Uh, but uh, from uh, the request from ROC, um, uh, there was no stipulation concerning uh, the treatment of uh, ROC Japan Peace Treaty of 1972 uh, in, in, in the joint communique. And it says that the PRC uh, reiterates that Taiwan is an inseparable part of PRC's treaty, and Japanese government fully understands Acts, uh, this position of uh, the PRC and upholds uh, the position uh, based upon the post uh, Declaration uh, Section 8. Uh, even today, the uh, Japanese government stresses uh, that uh, it fully uh, understands and respects um, uh, the position of PRC. On the other hand, the Beijing government uh, uh, emphasizes uh, the point that uh, uh, the communique says that the uh, Japanese government upholds uh, the position uh, of uh, based upon the section eight of uh, Potsdam uh, Declaration. Uh, from Cairo Declaration to Potsdam Declaration to San Francisco Peace Treaty, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, there was a uh, uh, flow. In Potsdam Declaration, it says that Japanese, uh, uh, the terms of the Cairo Declaration shall be carried out and Japanese sovereignty shall be limited to the islands of Honshu, Hokkaido, Shikoku, uh, Kyushu, and such minor islands as we determine. And uh, on the other hand, in the peace uh, uh, treaty with Japan, this is based upon the Potsdam Declaration, but it is referred only in Article 6. And so uh, from uh, Cairo to Potsdam to uh, Peace Treaty with Japan in San Francisco, uh, those are the different stages. And based upon such a uh, progress, uh, based upon uh, the Peace Treaty with Japan in San Francisco, uh, the reintegration of Japan into the international community, uh, and also uh, the international order in East Asia and Western Japan, Pacific are considered, and uh, of course, the signatories to uh, the Peace Treaty of Japan, uh, of course, obviously, and also based upon uh, uh, those uh, countries which signed uh, the related uh, uh, Peace Treaty with Japan, considered San Francisco Peace Treaty. Uh, uh, but uh, China uh, PRC. Uh, uh, which didn't sign San Francisco, and also uh, uh, Korea, uh, which is signed a treaty which is not uh, following the San Francisco Treaty. Those are the two uh, specific countries. And regarding these countries, there were some uh, changes, uh, differences in the interpretation of uh, the San Francisco Peace Treaty. So as uh, Dr. Hatano mentioned, those are countries out of the framework of San Francisco Treaty, and uh, those uh, 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 countries uh, and Japan seem to uh, 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 face with uh, the issues pending from the war uh, and San Francisco peace treaty uh, system or quasi system uh, seems to be read and reinterpreted uh, and uh, countries some countries are out of the framework the Japan China joint uh, communique focuses on the uh, Cairo and the Potsdam and the China uh, adamantly say that the, uh, the San Francisco Treaty regime is outside of the consideration. In the case of uh, the South Korea in 1980s, uh, uh, the 90s, because of the further democratization, uh, society started to offer objection to resolution given by the authoritative uh, government regime in the past, especially in South 
Korea and also in Taiwan, what uh, the, uh, the Shanghai set uh, did is in doubt. And partially in China, with certain uh, the increase of freedom of the press, uh, we also see the same trend. That's why we see uh, the cases of uh, the, the claims of individual damages, issues of human rights, and recently, transitional justice is another discourse where we see the, the new development of uh, the issue of individual compensation. And since early 1990s until 2005, as, Japan, as Dr. Hatano said, in judiciary, Japanese government tried to uh, listen to those uh, the trials in the judiciary and the, some, uh, it was quite difficult for the plaintiffs to win because of the, the time limit and sometimes the, 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 the companies could have been uh, held responsible and once uh, the trial is accepted uh, without uh, the the limit of the, the statute, uh, the it was there was a case when the partial or uh, the, uh, the 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 victory was available for individual boss. But because of the Supreme Court decision, uh, the introduced by Professor Hatano, uh, the Japanese judiciary uh, decided not to accept the cases, saying that there, there should be. Uh, the, uh, the voluntary efforts among individuals. And until 2005, uh, there has been some involvement uh, uh, of the judiciary, but uh, since 2006, it became political issues, especially because of the textbook issues. In coming to 2000, there has been uh, these movements starting from 1990s. Then we see the strong emergence of PRC. Then uh, the PRC, started to criticize the Cold War-based uh, the system and the Western Bloc. PRC concerning the security system and the order based on uh, the U.S. leadership is strictly uh, the criticized by PRC. That's how uh, the, the PRC started to discuss the issue of San Francisco, uh, the treat, uh, treaty. This is uh, the People's Daily in 2012. Uh, talking about what happened in 1951. And according to the article, uh, the, the Chinese leadership said that the San Francisco Treaty uh, was uh, born in uh, uh, the special condition of the Cold War. And uh, in the fascist war, a great contribution was made by uh, the Soviet Union and China, and they are not part of the system. Therefore, the San Francisco Treaty in many ways was not in line with the spirit of the Cairo Declaration and the past and proclamation. These are the argument studied in China, not officially first, but uh, since 1951, uh, the, the Shell and Line already uh, expressed uh, uh, this objection. But later on, uh, this statement became more official together with the changes of the, the nature of the open policy of China and the stronger opposition uh, to the San Francisco Peace Treaty emerged. Uh, this article was carried in 2012. Then in the same year, uh, the, the foreign minister of Gemba gave an article to the Herald Tribune talking about the Japanese uh, the perspective. He said that the, the post-war Japan started with the San Francisco Peace Treaty signed with the 48 countries. The treaty is an important part of the post-war international order. The Chinese government regards the treaty as illegal and invalid. In an attempt to uh, unilaterally change the, uh, the status quo, China did this was that. This was the strongest criticism by the foreign minister. And uh, the Chinese uh, foreign minister spokesperson said 
in the same year. Uh, the, uh, the Cairo Declaration and the post declaration were the first two declarations that ended the war between the Allied powers and the Japan. Uh, the China was outside of the framework San Francisco Treaty. China was not a signatory, therefore the treaty is not binding for China. It cannot be the basis for China and Japan to uh, the solve the post-war issues. So China clearly denied the validity or the legality of the San Francisco Treaty. Then in Japan, under Abe, uh, the government, there was a question and an answer in the diet regarding the government recognition of the Postum Declaration of the San Francisco Peace Treaty. And the government answered the post-war declaration was a statement of the principle of occupation and administration of Japan by the Allied power until the state of the war with the Allied powers was ended by the Treaty of Peace with Japan. The effect of the said declaration ceased to be effective as soon as the said treaty came. San Francisco and the Cairo and the post relationship are not part of the history, yet they are alive and with it. As I mentioned at the beginning, in the post-war, uh, the, the East Asian international order based on the San Francisco order is has been here. And uh, this determined the course of the post-war, uh, the recovery of Japan. But we see the fluctuation of the system. And in relation to that, issues concerning history are emerging or surfacing again. And I talked about what the China is saying recently, and that you clearly understand what's changing. In East Asia, the order or the, the issue about the order in the Pacific area is emerging. Then the San Francisco Peace Treaty has been the basis for US and its allies alone. And China is clearly saying that China does not follow San Francisco. Rather, China would be based on Cairo and the Potsdam. So on the post, uh, uh, the Mao Tse-Tung, uh, not Chiang Kai-shek, and Mao was on the post uh, when the China uh, they prepare uh, a cinema on Cairo declaration, although he, Mao was not in the conference. And this became a big issue because this is a vivid issue, issue alive for China. There is another problem. Now we see a big framework and we see changes. As Professor Hatano mentioned, we see the changes of the internal situation in the case of Ukraine, for example. Another change is that the San Francisco Peace Treaty or the related treaties and agreements related to that, even on that perspective, in each context, we see the difference of interpretations. And since 1990, we see the decision by the judiciary issue of the transitional justice, human rights, and the individual compensations. We also see the changes of understanding and positioning of treaties and agreements, uh, the, uh, the, the responsibility for Japan's colonial rule, and the indemnity to individuals, and the issue for the individual Compensation should not have the time limit to bring lawsuit. These issues are coming back again and again. But this is because those kind of discourses are gaining momentum because they are more justified in the international discourse. So we need two perspectives when we discuss the situation right now. And concerning Taiwan, please allow me to say something concerning Taiwan, ROC, we do see difficulties uh, concerning uh, the Asino Japanese peace treaty. When uh, the China Japan joint communique was issued in 1972, and the, the 
the, the Taiwan government declared the end of the relationship, diplomatic relationship. But I have to say that there exist some issues about the history and those coming from the peace settlement between Taiwan and Japan. Uh, the traditional justice is what the current government is demanding right now. It's about transition. Transition, in the case of the current government, uh, the one party ruled by the National Party to the democratization. That is the phase of transition. So two to eight or the title uh, uh, this is caused by the national list of government becomes an issue. But this is not what the national list of government or the, uh, the power is saying. In their say, saying the transition would mean the transition uh, from the Japanese colonial rule to the administration and the nationalist uh, party. So in the case of Taiwan, like Korea, we see some changes of the political discourses. So human rights, traditional justice are the concept we have to consider when we think about the issue of history. And from that perspective, San Francisco Peace Treaty and the related treaties and agreement, how should we redefine and we understand these are going to be quite important going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kawashima. Thank you for a very rich insight. As I de referred to EHK, I talked about the dialogue between the past and the future. Uh, the, now we are in 2023, and the, the book was published in 2022. Now we have a new document material available. And with newly available documents, we can review San Francisco Treaty. treaty. We can find new facts and we might change the way we understand the treaty with a deep understanding of this treaty. I believe we can have a deeper understanding of the current political situation. That's what I learned from Professor Kawashima. We see the confrontation between the US and the China. And uh, this is because of the difference of the concepts about the security among three. Japan and the uh, US would like to maintain the San Francisco treaty system, but China criticized the treaty system as a legacy of the Cold War. So uh, Professor Kawashima talked about the San Francisco peace treaty with Japan itself, and those other arrangements related or based on the San Francisco peace treaty and uh, with that aspect, he, he talked about the negotiation conducted between Japan and China, between Japan and Korea, which are being shaken right now. And the San Francisco Treaty system itself is in turmoil, according to his explanation. So for us in Japan, as we have many difficulties, so for Japan, how should Japan maintain the San Francisco treaty-based system, or how should Japan or should not change the revise this system? We have issues uh, among uh, the, not only among the states, but also between individuals and the states. So to traditional or uh, the way of thinking may not be sufficient. Now we have to deal with newly emerging issues and that might change the way we should understand and interpret history. Thank you very much. Now, from Japanese perspective or from perspective of Japan and United States, I'd like to turn to uh, Professor Ayako Kusunoki, Professor of International Research Center for Japanese Studies, Ichibunkan. Uh, Professor Kusunoki, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was listening so intently uh, to uh, Professor Kawashima's uh, report, and uh, I was uh, trying to take notes, but I really listened to uh, him uh, uh, with a great deal of interest. Uh, uh, Dr. Katano and Professor Kawashima discussed uh, this uh, peace treaty system, how it was uh, read and uh, reinterpreted in the subsequent periods and uh, in the Cold War 
after the end of war, how uh, there was uh, um, positioned and how it has been changing. Now, uh, when uh, the San Francisco conference was being held, what was the thoughts on the part of Japan and the United States? Uh, that's how I would like to uh, focus my report on uh, uh, today. Now, the Treaty of Peace with Japan, uh, from a long-term perspective, when I try to take that perspective from uh, the end of 19th century onwards, uh, a war between states, especially a war between uh, big powers, broke. Then a treaty of peace was uh, concluded, and a treaty of peace usually determines uh, the victorious and defeated countries and uh, determine uh, the uh, national border uh, lines and also repatriation uh, and issues arising from the war uh, and issues concerned with the war and also uh, the regional or international order after the end of war uh, was defined by such a, a, a treaty of peace and that marked the end of the war itself now regarding the uh, treaty of peace with japan perhaps uh, that was at the very end of uh, such a, a treaty of uh, peace uh, use uh, the war between uh, major uh, states uh, didn't take place after that, uh, although there were some uh, uh, cold war, and even when a war broke up, a uh, uh, truce or uh, ceasefire agreements uh, were uh, what, in a sense, uh, ended the war and not a treaty of peace. And so, perhaps the treaty of peace uh, with Japan uh, is uh, the last one uh, of uh, the treaty of peace of that kind and uh, there were accumulation of negotiations uh, in uh, the treaty and uh, there was a, a lot of uh, wisdom put into it and as a combination of such efforts uh, the treaty of peace was signed with japan and in a sense that was uh, the uh, epitome of how a peace was formed uh, from uh, the 19th century uh, to the 20th century onward in uh, the history of international politics as uh, dr hatano mentioned imperialism and uh, the uh, rule uh, by imperial uh, colonial uh, empires uh, in the case of japan uh, the end of the uh, japanese empire was defined by this uh, treaty of peace with japan uh, but uh, it was uh, not participated uh, by uh, the victim countries of those uh, colonialism by japan and that was one of the issues as uh, uh, dr hatano mentioned uh, in the case of united kingdom or france uh, which had colonies then were parties to the Treaty of Peace with Japan. And those countries uh, tried to uh, incorporate into the discussion leading to the Treaty of Peace with Japan the fact that they still had the colonial uh, col colonies, and that was still part of the imperialism um, casting shadow on them and uh, the Cold War. And Cold War. Uh, obviously uh, had a major impact on the formation of the Treaty of Peace with Japan, as we heard from Dr. Hatano and Professor Kawashima. From that the major current, uh, how uh, we need to look at what about the Treaty of Peace with Japan should be viewed again. Uh, one point is majority peace as an approach. And second is issues concerning security and those are the two major topics i'd like to cover now uh, the majority peace approach and uh, germany italy and japan the axis countries uh, the possible settlement concerning those countries were uh, to be uh, done and dealt with through cooperation among the major powers but was a sort of agreement at the end of war recording uh, the treaty of peace with italy uh, 
Uh, although I'm not sure whether that can be called a cooperation among a major a country, but that was realized in that manner. And regarding the uh, making peace with Japan, United States, UK, and Soviet Union, and uh, uh, Communist China, uh, those are the four countries that should, uh, that should lead uh, the peacemaking with Japan. That was one important uh, assertion. Uh, and in that in a sense, it has a legitimacy. But for the United States, uh, they had to find a legitimate reason uh, not to to overcome this uh, question. Uh, for the United States, a peacemaking with Japan uh, was positioned uh, against the backdrop of the Cold War. As a member of the Western Bloc, the United States wanted to help Japan, and that, uh, uh, from an American point of view, served the benefits for the United States and the demanding the war responsibility from Japan uh, or uh, prevention of Japanese re-aggression, there is the restrictions. Uh, uh, placing placement were not a major priority issue uh, for the United States at the time. Uh, rather, uh, to form a Western bloc led order uh, was uh, important the priority for United States in making peace with Japan and security uh, and uh, peace with Japan were integrated with each other how to set an international security order and how a security of Japan after the independence can be uh, maintained uh, and security of uh, uh, Western nations in East Asia, in Asia Pacific uh, need to be uh, maintained. And also uh, for United States, uh, Okinawa uh, had uh, important uh, strategic value. And so stra strategic uh, benefits for the United States and for the security of uh, Asia Pacific, uh, the Treaty of Peace with Japan and uh, other uh, related uh, uh, treaties uh, and agreements were a, a major agenda of a great importance for the United States. But for the Soviet Union, these um, uh, thoughts by the United States um, cannot be agreed to, uh, even without uh, uh, the consent from uh, the Soviet Union, uh, uh, Western uh, nations uh, should uh, try to achieve a peace with Japan. And that was a sort of a preliminary decision uh, made and uh, in that direction uh, things began to move uh, in autumn 1949 so that was a peace making through agreements among those uh, big countries then what about the position in, in japan in the end of 1948 onward uh, what should be the form of uh, a treaty of peace with japan uh, was a center of a major discussion uh, within the people uh, within the people concerned uh, there was a call for overall peace uh, peace should be made with all the countries allied powers especially intellectuals such as maria mamasao were the well-known advocate of such a uh, overall peace making uh, peace should be made with all uh, allied powers and uh, this is an idea coming out of uh, Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution. Uh, if we live up to the expectation and the principle of Article 9, uh, a peace shouldn't be made uh, that seems to take side with uh, either uh, one of uh, the parties. Uh, rather, overall peace should be sought after. And after a uh, treaty of peace, uh, Japan should maintain neutrality uh, and also uh, there should be no uh, military base of the allied powers in Japan. Those were the three uh, peace principles advocated by many intellectuals uh, and also leftist uh, politicians in Japan uh, in support of overall peace. And uh, another uh, principle that is objection to rearmament of Japan uh, was added and thus uh, four principles of peace uh, was uh, put forward as a very strong uh, uh, argument uh, in Japanese uh, intellectual community and also in the political world. Uh, that was the overall peace discussion. Now on a majority peace, 
uh, although peace, uh, of course, was desirable, but uh, if we stick to it, then uh, the peace can never be achieved against the backdrop called war. That was the idea. Uh, in, in order to achieve early recovery of independence, Japan should try to uh, make peace with as many states as possible. That was the idea behind majority uh, peace. And those uh, states meant making peace with the countries of the Western Bloc. So uh, they uh, placed importance upon uh, the Japanese uh, independence and also uh, uh, the um, relationship of trust with the Western countries that meant the distrust of the Soviet Union. Uh, Shigeru Yoshida um, uh, liberal parties were conservative parties and uh, conservative intellectuals uh, supported uh, this view of a majority peace. Uh, this uh, majority uh, peace approach it was, after all, what the Japanese uh, government uh, chose afterwards. And uh, they had a sense that that was the only uh, choice possible. But reading the documents at the time, the Ministry of uh, uh, Foreign Affairs had hesitation in choosing uh, majority peace. They had a meticulous analysis of what are the merits and demerits of majority of peace. Uh, and the merits mean that they could achieve uh, early independence and they will be able to develop the economy and they can have the security assured. Uh, but uh, the uh, con was uh, the difficulty of achieving peace with China. So the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, had a lot of uh, agitation. But on the other hand, Shigeru Yoshida uh, thought that uh, majority of peace was the only approach possible. Uh, even right before the beginning of the conference, uh, majority uh, peace approach was in a lot of uh, discussion and there were divided opinions. And uh, as uh, Dr. Kawashima mentioned, uh, the relations between uh, the uh, Treaty of Peace and the Potsdam Declaration, based upon uh, the Potsdam Declaration, what uh, moves the Soviet Union would uh, going to take vis-a-vis uh, -vis Japan, that was a major uh, source of concern. And there was a lot of uh, studies and analysis done on the Potsdam Declaration and uh, the uh, dr uh, drafting of the Treaty of Peace. So a uh, majority of peace was a very difficult uh, uh, choice for Japan uh, back in those days. Now, uh, what was the move by the Soviet Union? Uh, they participated in the conference for uh, drafting a uh, treaty of peace with Japan, and uh, the treaty of peace uh, uh, drafted was uh, generous, and the Soviet Union uh, was uh, really unsatisfied with the contents, uh, uh, but with that sentiment, they took part in the conference and tried to uh, obstruct the discussion in the uh, meetings as much as possible, and uh, their draft the Soviet Union's proposal uh, was uh, very interesting, in a sense. Uh, first, uh, the preparation uh, by United States, UK, uh, China, and Soviet Union uh, should uh, take part in the drafting, uh, and uh, uh, it should be the conference uh, with the participation of all allied uh, powers, and it shouldn't be led by the United States. And uh, the uh, uh, scope of uh, lost uh, scope of territories when Japan uh, will lose its sovereignty and uh, the uh, affiliation of such territories should be explicitly written and Okinawa uh, be returned to Okinawa. That's an interesting point. And the complete withdrawal uh, of the occupation forces in uh, not more than 19 days from the entry into force of the uh, treaty and also Japanese uh, repatriation, repatriation uh, duties and uh, political uh, limitations were placed, and also uh, the respect of uh, the fundamental human rights as uh, duties to be executed uh, by the Japanese government regarding the security. Uh, it would allow a certain level of rearmament to Japan, but no participation in any military alliance. And also the four uh, straits, Soya, uh, Nemuro, uh, Tsugaru and Tsushima, those are straits, and the uh, Japanese coast alongside should be uh, disarmed. So, um, return of Okinawa 
and the withdrawal of the occupation forces uh, had a certain appeal to the Japanese uh, uh, opinions. Those were included in the Soviet Union's uh, proposal. On the other hand, uh, it stipulated the Japanese uh, uh, obligation to pay reparations that was a appealing point for Southeast Asian countries and also for security, uh, demilitarization or disarmament of Japan uh, seemed to be a very important uh, uh, point of interest for the Soviet Union. And that was the uh, proposal uh, uh, draft. But of course, uh, they were not allowed to even submit such a proposal uh, to the table. Uh, in a sense, uh, some of the contents that they propose may be uh, more acceptable uh, than the American uh, draft uh, for some uh, allied uh, countries. And so, uh, but uh, there was a little, a little chances that such a, a peace treaty uh, led by the Soviet Union uh, be realized. But those were the major points of uh, their thought. Now about the security. Um, uh, the uh, Treaty of Peace with Japan and also uh, the uh, Japan-US uh, uh, security uh, treaties uh, define uh, security. Uh, Article 5 of the Treaty of Peace with Japan defines uh, security. It says that uh, Japan accepts the obligations uh, on the Charter of the United Nations, uh, uh, but, and at the same time, uh, Japan is given uh, the right of uh, the collective and individual uh, self-defense and cooperation to uh, the uh, collective uh, uh, security. Those uh, rights and uh, uh, duties are specified. In Article 6 of the Peace Treaty talk about the withdrawal of the occupied uh, the forces within 90 days. But it also said that the, based on a separate agreement, uh, the, the, the armed forces of foreign country could be stationed in Japan. As for the Japan-US Security Treaty in the preamble to the treaty, said that in exercise of right of individual and the collective self-defense Japan, Japan desires as a provisional arrangement for its defense that the U.S. Uh, should maintain armed forces. It also said that the Japan will increasingly assume responsibility for its defense against direct and indirect aggression. And this is Article 1 of the same treaty. Japan has the obligation to allow U.S. to have bases in Japan, and uh, the article also stated the purposes of the bases. And the, the former uh, the treaty uh, in Article 4, you can see some hints about uh, the time limit of the overall the treaty. It does not have any time limits. We said that the this treaty shall expire. Such there shall when there shall have come into force such UN arrangement or such alternative individual collective security dispositions. We allowed to Japan participation in collective security and the exercise of the right of individual and collective self-defense for a range of uh, policies for Japan to construct armament for self-defense and participation in regional collective security frameworks were also allowed. And concerning providing a basis on the mainland for the U.S. military, this is also range of the policy allowed for Japan. As to its basis in UN Charter, and that became a big issue later on in Japan. But this shows you the scope of the policies that are accepted for Japan internationally. 
but uh, this was different from the interpretation by the Japanese government at that time, or different from the policy taken by the Japanese government back then. Concerning this the security treatment, I want to talk about what was the agreement, because that this treaty was uh, defined as a provisional arrangement. In this article, in Article 4, it talks about that, that this is uh, the, the provisional arrangement for the security of Japan. The U.S. has a long-term objective, that is, to think about the regional uh, collective security system. For that purpose, it was uh, provisional. But for Japan, it was regarded to be provisional because Article 1 showed the asymmetry of rights and obligation. So the Japanese government believed that this asymmetry uh, is provisional. When Japan has more uh, the, the capability in defense, this asymmetry should go away. And the stationing of the U.S. Uh, the armed forces on mainland was regarded to be provisional by the Japanese government, along with the, uh, the, the increase of the capability of Japan. So we see a big disagreement between Japan and U.S. since 1950s. And we see the confrontation because of the security understanding between Japan and the U.S. This is also coming from how they differed in terms of the understanding of the treaty. The, according to U.S. and the regional uh, collective security uh, framework, according to ANZAS and the U.S. Philippine Major Defense Treaty, they stated that, that these treaties are effective until the time when the uh, the regional more comprehensive uh, security framework comes into effect. So we can say that the U.S. government was assuming a longer term perspective that is to build a regional collective security system. So can I talk about if uh, the, the taking the choice of the majority piece was quite difficult, but what if Japanese government had opted for overall peace, peace settlement? in an overall manner. I always think about this possibility. What could have happened? I think I have uh, time to talk about it later on. I have to say that the, the majority peace was not the easy option for Japan. So when we think about the characteristics of this uh, San Francisco Treaty, we have to think about if or what if Japan opted for. Uh, of our peace treaty. As for the tentativeness and the sustainability of the Japan-US agreement, back in 1950s, none of the, uh, the parties of this uh, security treaty thought that uh, this is going to be perpetual. They thought that the, they are going to be, these are the provisional arrangement. And the agreement back in 1951 has been maintained To today, especially in the, the thing did not change during the Cold War. So we have to try to understand what made it possible to have such a sustainability for that agreement back in 1950s. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Kusunoki. From Japanese perspective, uh, San Francisco peace treaty or uh, peace treaty system uh, should be and can be viewed. Uh, especially the agreement uh, or order uh, made uh, between Japan and United States uh, was uh, considered provisional or rather it was formed in the situation of a little bit of fluidity. And the Soviet Union also prepared a counter proposal, a draft for the a Treaty of Peace with Japan. Uh, if United States and Soviet Union had had a uh, discussion and if together uh, they met the formation of the Treaty of Peace with Japan, uh, the uh, 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 situation uh, after the end of war for Japan uh, might have been really different. Now, I would like to have a uh, intermission, but before that, I'd like to ask uh, Akakawa uh, to take over. Uh, uh, Professor Mot 
Hosoya, thank you very much for moderation. And all the speakers, thank you very much for your contributions. Now I'd like to have an intermission. Thank you very much for the good time management. We would like to resume the program at 20 minutes to 6. So to then, I would like you to have a break. Thank you. みなさまお待たせいたしました。それでは再開いたします。え、再開の前に1.5案内でございますけれども、本日オンラインでのご参加の方からは9&Aの持ちいてご質問を受け付けております。すでにチャットでご案内。Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to resume the program. Uh, for those of you participating online, please put your uh, questions on the chat. Now, Professor Hosoya, please. Thank you. We have listened to uh, three experts who gave us a presentation from content. Next speaker is uh, the Dr. Nishimura, Institute researcher of International Research Center for Japanese Studies for his comment. Thank you for kind introduction. I am uh, the Institute researcher. My name is Masahiko Nishimura of International Research Center for Japanese Studies. Uh, in a, uh, uh, the, the symposium like this, usually uh, the speakers are uh, younger uh, together with the senior uh, experts giving the comment. And the, uh, he, today uh, it's quite diverse and I'm not in a position to offer any comments to the presentation given by the uh, senior researchers. So please allow me to share with you my personal view on Japan-US relationship and the, my impression after reading the book, San Francisco Peace Settlement in East Asia published last year. And uh, I would like to express my view, I hope that the my senior researchers are going to help me understand my own issues. This book, San Francisco Peace Settlement and East Asia, are made up of three parts. The first chapter is mainly about Japan, and the second part is about the US and the UK and France, and the third is based on the the views of East Asian countries of China, Taiwan, and the Philippines. And each paper represents the individual or the scope of research by each author. So it's quite difficult to summarize. But first of all, concerning the issue of the US Japan's security treaty and rearmament, which tend to be the main focus of this kind of study. But this book uh, looked at things other than that aspect. When the Cold War became quite serious and the security did have an impact on how the peace settlement was formed for Japan. So that's why uh, mainly the study of the history of Japanese diplomacy depended on the Japan-US security system. But in this book, uh, issues like reparation, economic aspects, and uh, uh, the, the negative feeling coming from the colonial rule were deeply discussed by authors. Another characteristic of this book, I don't know whether it's intentional or not, but the country covered by this book are limited to the countries in the Western bloc or the on the West. So the mutual interaction between the East and the West was not discussed. But I think this book is a wonderful package to show what happened in one camp in the Western bloc the influence of US was quite dominant 
But in each state and nation, situation and intention were quite diverse. And that kind of diversity within the Western bloc was another characteristic of this book that was clearly described. When the book discussed each country's relationship with the San Francisco Treaty of Peace, and uh, you can discuss the consequence of the treaty, direct consequence. And another aspect is what was the other party's mind when they negotiated with Japan? And this book was focused on the latter aspect as to rather than the impact on the individual agreement or impact from the individual agreement, the focus of the book was more on to how each country came to term with Japan in terms of restoring relationship. As for the relationship between uh, the peace uh, system and the Cold War, often it's pointed out by the academic uh, that the the start of the Cold War did have big impact on Japan that enabled more generous peace settlement for Japan. This is a usual discourse. But when we try to think about the impact of this peace settlement on the Cold War, you can get good insights. Professor Michael Shara followed what he had been talking about from before. When Japan lost China, lost China as a market, you had thought that the Japan should find an alternative market in the Southeast Asia. And in order to secure the Southeastern Asia as a possible market for Japan, uh, the U.S. commitment was strengthened and this led to the Vietnam War. According to Professor Miyashita, uh, the, because France is a European country, the party, uh, diplomacy of France uh, was prioritized with what could happen in Europe. So uh, the France did not want to have the peace settlement that would stimulate the Soviet Union and would become the president of rearmament for Germany. So the Japanese peace settlement is related to the Cold War being staged in Europe. And uh, Dr. Fosoya said that the uh, the U.S. and the U.K. collaborated in establishing a peace settlement with Japan, and in that process, uh, the the U.K. had to make a lot of consensus to Australia, that uh, resulted in the compromise influence in Asia Pacific by U.K. So another important aspect of this book is that it talked about the impact of the San Francisco peace system on the international politics and the Cold War. What can we further study in the future? It's difficult for me to state it, but the recent trend of the research is, is that the, we see the resurgence of the studies about the Japanese diplomatic history in 1950s. In 2009, the, the government shifted to the, the, the Democratic Party, and also under the, the following LDP, again, uh, the MOFA became quite active in disclosing the diplomatic documents. So we now have greater access to the documents not available in the past. We see the disclosure of private documents by important politicians. And this made it easier for us to study the domestic political history in Japan. And in Japan and abroad, many materials are becoming available online. So we see a better access to materials. Sometimes we may have too much material, but I have to say that it's easier for us to conduct the research. Another point is that the 1950s was a starting point for the post-war Japanese diplomacy. And the decision made by the policies back then still have impact on today. Therefore, this topic makes it a quite interesting research topic for me. Uh, 
recently we see new perspectives and uh, like uh, uh, the the, the the other countries like Cambodia, Burma, and the non-state parties, and uh, the people's movement after the end of the empire. I think there is another uh, increasing interest in the formation of alliance in Asia, perhaps because of the worsening the security relationship in Asia. In Asia. Also, it's different from uh, NATO. The discussion about the hub and spokes are being discussed, or we see researches on how ANZAS was formed, or the as to the Seattle. Uh, now we see movement to reassess uh, the importance of Seattle. Although sometimes it has been criticized as not having any substance. Now I have a couple of questions. So it is starting with a very ambiguous question. When we look back on the San Francisco peace settlement today, how should we evaluate? What should we evaluate about the San Francisco treaty system? It may depend on the party, but through the signing of the San Francisco treaty, uh, the, there were several objectives to be realized. In 1951, some things could not be realized, and some uh, the themes took time to be realized. And according to Professor Hatano, there are some issues that has not been realized, although it was part of the ideals in the San Francisco Treaty. Uh, one aspect is the U.S. defense commitment. I'm afraid I don't have time to go into the detail. Back in 1951, the commitment was partial, then later on it expanded. Thinking about the Vietnam War, I'm afraid that this may not apply to the Soviet Asia, but uh, thinking about uh, the uh, Taiwan and the, the South Korea, one of the aim for U.S. was to prevent war for those divided states, and uh, the U.S. Defense commitment, to defense commitment did have a role to stabilize this region. And another uh, big objective for the peace settlement is to pull Japan toward the Western Bloc. Could a peace settlement with Japan achieve that objective? U.S. did not want to have U.S. neutralized or communized at all. Uh, the economic issues and the security agreement with Japan were successful in enhancing the Japanese capability to get rid of its vulnerability. And another issue is return of Japan to the international society. There are some issues that could not be realized at the time San Francisco Treaty does, or some remained unconscious. But the, many of the things achieved after the San Francisco were conducted and solved many issues according to the framework of the San Francisco treatment system. There are some challenges remain unsolved, but the, there are things that had uh, some improvement. According to Dr. Taizo Miyagi, uh, the General Peace Settlement helped Japan to become an uh, economic uh, big power based on pacifism. So, as to how we should reevaluate the various San Francisco peace treatment system, we can think about what were the possible alternatives. Were there any point of time when Japan made a wrong decision? 
This is my question to all the speakers. Now, one more point. Although this is rather detailed, I apologize for this. Uh, this is a question I'd like to throw to uh, Dr. Hatano. As I mentioned a bit earlier, I am interested in the possibility of Japan going neutral. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Hatano is uh, well versed about East Asia, Southeast Asian Development Initiative. And this is the question I'd like to throw. According to uh, Dr. Schaller, uh, in order to prevent Japan becoming communist or neutral, uh, it was uh, uh, important to find a Japanese trading partner instead of United, uh, China. And United States considered Southeast Asia could become a good replacement of China. And Japan side also became really eager uh, to uh, develop uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, borrowing a lot of money from the United States and develop uh, uh, resources in East Asia and then uh, manufacture goods uh, in Japan. Uh, but this is rather naive. First, it was not easy to get the funding from the United States. And also, as it was right after the war, Southeast Asian countries were critical of Japan. Uh, and uh, they might have a concern that Japan might rule Southeast Asian uh, uh, economy uh, again. So this uh, feasibility, I think, was low. Uh, and uh, uh, this how the Japanese government uh, viewed such an initiative and uh, the circumstances around that time. And secondly, uh, this is an uh, issue still ongoing today. Uh, that is a uh, solution to the post-war uh, wartime worker issue uh, with uh, Korea, uh, led by a Korean government, uh, forming foundation uh, and uh, they may collect the donations from the companies of both Japan and uh, ROK and pay uh, money to uh, wartime workers instead of reparation monies. And this might realize, and uh, Dr. Hatano uh, predicted others uh, in his book, Japanese History Issues. Uh, he says that uh, the current uh, solution uh, may uh, uh, turn to be uh, something similar to foundation or fun funding making, but no matter what uh, solution they may find, uh, it will not be a fundamental uh, solution for the two issues. Uh, but against the background of two issues, there are a, a global uh, conundrum of uh, overcoming uh, colonial, uh, colonialism, that is uh, decolonization, which is not limited to a Japanese colonial rule. And so uh, he mentions that therefore this would not be a fundamental solution. So this is the second question I'd like to ask to Dr. Hantano whether such an idea could be possible or feasible. Now uh, to Professor Kawashima and about his uh, report. In his discussion today, uh, he discussed uh, the relationship between China and the San Francisco peace treaty system and or uh, the absence of relationship between the two. Uh, especially, uh, he discussed how uh, the peacemaking with Japan was discussed in China uh, in the early uh, days after uh, the end of World War II. Uh, and uh, Japan was worried, um, China was worried that Japan would uh, become more aggressive again. And China uh, uh, was um, uh, emphasizing that was uh, the biggest uh, victim of Japanese aggression. And that was the starting point for the relationship between China and Japan. And from 1945 to 1947, um, uh, getting uh, reparations or uh, disarmament or uh, war criminal issues and uh, militarism and uh, the economic uh, restrictions or return of uh, Okinawa to China, those uh, strict conditions were discussed in China. Uh, but in uh, the peace treaty between Japan and ROC, it was more or less um, uh, conforming, conforming to San Francisco peace treaty with Japan and uh, the uh, China's uh, uh, desires were not really reflected. And ROC also uh, discussed the possibility of uh, uh, reparations in the discussion uh, table, but uh, it was, renounced at the, the time. 
and international status of China uh, declined due to the civil war and as a result of Article 26 of a treaty with Japan of San Francisco, he, China was not able to exert its own influence. And in the United States uh, Congress, there were China lobbies supporting uh, Chiang Kai-shek, and they had a certain influence. And by using such uh, uh, approach, uh, China might have been able to uh, get uh, better uh, conditions and terms. Uh, by influencing United States government uh, terms better than uh, the peace treaty in general or the Japan ROC peace treaty. And one more point is uh, Okinawa. Uh, ROC uh, in the Cairo discussion proposed uh, the joint management of Okinawa by United States and China, but was, that was not specified or written in in the Cairo declaration. And the discussion continued on in China, but uh, from 1950s to 1960s, uh, they, uh, they supported uh, pro-independent uh, groups in Okinawa, uh, uh, but uh, raising strong objection to San Francisco Peace Treaty, uh, uh, which seemed to have uh, um, uh, admitted the potential uh, ruling uh, by uh, Japan. Uh, uh, it wasn't become a major discussion point in uh, the discussion of uh, Japan ROC uh, peace treaty. And so I wonder to what extent Okinawa territorial issue was important for ROC. Now to uh, Professor Kusunoki, uh, how Japan chose a majority peace? That was the main discussion uh, developed by uh, Dr. Pro Kusunoki. Uh, my first question is, uh, what is the assessment of Yoshida's uh, peace diplomacy. Uh, in the field of Japanese diplomacy history, uh, there were a discussion concerning uh, the diplomatic uh, capability of Yoshida in the 1990s. Uh, Japan wanted to keep American troops in Japan, but on the other hand, United States wanted to uh, continue to station uh, their troops in the United States. Uh, but um, uh, uh, Japan uh, and the United States were on par with each other, but Japan failed in the negotiation vis-a-vis -vis the United States, and as a result, uh, the treaty uh, became unequal. But when you look at the prepared and finished uh, the Japan-U.S. Uh, Security Treaty and the Peace Treaty, uh, what is uh, Yoshida's capability as a diplomat? Uh, in a sense, uh, under the occupation, uh, uh, Japan had uh, limited the capabilities and allowance uh, in uh, the right to diplomacy or to formal uh, transactions. And so I wonder uh, to what extent Yoshida was able to exercise his originality in diplomacy uh, behind this uh, peace treaty and uh, Japan-US peace security. And in Japan-US peace security, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, the treaty was uh, uh, provisional as uh, it was on stage to prepare a more comprehensive security treaty in the future and also uh, to the stationing of American troops in Japanese main island. Uh, but the re-element of Japan or stationing of the American troops uh, in Japan uh, it may be legitimized uh, by using the Pacific uh, Treaty a proposal as a method. As, so how should we view ANZUS uh, uh, Treaty? Uh, uh, the American military presence in Japan was considered provisional at the time, uh, but even today there is such a presence in Japan. And so. Uh, Around when uh, the American presence, military presence in Japan was considered to be something of an everlasting matter. Uh, sorry that my points were rather sporadic and all my questions are out of my own curiosity, but thank you very much for your kind attention. And those are the questions I'd like to throw to discussant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nishimura. Uh, three speakers were given uh, questions. 
uh, by him in order to deepen our understanding of uh, the situation and uh, their uh, contributions. And also out of his own uh, curiosity, he expanded uh, the understanding of uh, the discussions uh, by three speakers. Now I'd like to turn to the three speakers uh, to give us uh, their uh, responses to Dr. Nishimura's questions. And at the same time, the speakers uh, may have something they would like to add after they listen to the comments and discussion by the fellow speakers or questions they might have uh, for the fellow uh, speakers. Uh, each one is given eight minutes. And uh, please uh, try to answer Dr. Nishimura's question as much as possible. So let us start with uh, Dr. Hatano. Thank you very much for uh, very good questions. Starting with a general question, I think I would like to discuss this later, sorry. I would like to respond to specific question, two of them first. Uh, the around 1950s, Southeast Asia development concept was prepared by Japan and US using the US money and the resources in Southeast Asia together with efforts by Japan. Japan and US are to collaborate to develop Southeast Asia. Back then, the Korean War was toward its end. And uh, this concept was assumed on the the Korean War. So this concept had a, a lot of militaristic perspective or military perspective. So this was closely connected to the Cold War. But and, uh, out of no, almost nothing was realized from this concept or uh, development uh, uh, of uh, mines in India was perhaps the one that somewhat succeeded. So it was quite difficult to realize the ideas in this concept. But more than that, in 1950s in Southeast Asian region, when Japan used Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, it meant the current uh, South Asia, like India, Pakistan, and uh, so, the concept of Southeast Asia is a concept in the Cold War. And uh, in the Southeast Asia, uh, the India was a case where the issue of reparation was easily resolved. And the, the trade with India and the Pakistan were quite important for Japan back then. So rather than focusing on development of the Southeast Asia, the relationship with Japan and uh, South India was quite important, at least until the, 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 the first half of 1950s. But coming into the second half of the 1950s, uh, the Burma and uh, the countries to the east, those countries started to have impact of the Cold War. the South Asia, Southeast Asia, which included uh, the, the South uh, Asia like India, are now divided into two different regions. So rather than the development of the Southeast Asia, uh, the, the focus of Japan was toward South Asia. As to the issue of wartime laborers, Yes, I said this in the book, but I said that the, in 2015, there was agreement between Japan and South Korea. This was renounced, but in South Korea, uh, in the process of the renunciation of the agreement, a lot of preparation were done, a lot of interview were done together with uh, the the wartime labor so that the, the South Korea could continue that agreement. And uh, that's the reason 
why I said that the, despite uh, the, the sincere efforts, uh, the fundamental resolution would be quite difficult. You may be able to get an agreement between the two states, Japan and South Korea, but these two issues of comfort women and wartime laborers in principle from the perspective of South Korea. This is an issue arriving from the colonial rule by Japan. The root cause, according to Korea, is in the colonial rule of Japan. Unless this colonial rule issue is, is, is resolved only with the assumption uh, with that the, the Japanese colonial rule was illegal, the solution would be uh, the fundamentally accepted by Korea. So as long as the legality of the colonial rule uh, is there, it's quite difficult to find a good solution. Uh, the, this is a global issue. Uh, internationally, the colonialism, the issue of colonialism and its illegality of the colonial rule There has been cases where the issue of the colonial rule is resolved based on the concept of the illegality of the colonial rule. But there is a reference to the transitional justice. In relation to the transitional justice, uh, the issue of the colonial rule might gain international influence and uh, the South Korea's view on the colonial rule might be transformed. So what was realized, what was not realized, the first question, I would like to respond later. Thank you very much, Professor Hatano. So uh, we are going to ask you to speak later. Thank you. Professor Kawashima, please. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, Mr. Nishimura has given me some questions. So including by general comments, I'd like to respond or well, try to respond. Uh, when we were editing this uh, collection of essays, Ukrainian war wasn't there. So we didn't expect to see such a big transformation in the international order. And we began this uh, editing work. And one thing we were thinking, and things I didn't mention earlier, is that uh, the uh, transformation uh, in the study and research of Cold War uh, in the past, United States, the UK, and Soviet Union, especially United States and UK, uh, often the case that Cold War was uh, uh, history was considered from uh, their uh, viewpoints. And then at the, after the end of Cold War, uh, Soviet uh, documents were disclosed and the East Asian uh, documents were disclosed, which advanced the research and studies on the Cold War era in the case of East Asia. A post war documents were published in Taiwan, uh, released and published in Korea and China, uh, disclosed uh, the uh, documents up until 1964. So, a logic uh, within uh, various regions uh, was uh, revealed after another, and uh, China uh, economy and culture and Okinawa and uh, Kimon and uh, Hong Kong uh, from uh, those uh, micron spaces, we began to see the situation. And so San Francisco Peace Treaty, of course, is an important uh, point, uh, but even in the studies in Japan, uh, there isn't enough studies using uh, diplomatic documents from East Asian countries. And we have begun to see uh, new uh, diplomatic documents which were published more recently. And so uh, we need to uh, look at uh, uh, from those uh, newer perspectives. But like Haban spoke, uh, uh, we shouldn't be have been spokes in our studies and research. In certain cases, we have to expect that. But for instance, the relation between Taiwan and Korean, and Taiwan and the Philippines, 
and also as was written uh, in the uh, report on the secret uh, agreement uh, between Japan and uh, ROK, um, uh, there are a lot of uh, negotiations and dialogue within East Asia, and we need to um, look and analyze from those countries and regarding the divided uh, nation, uh, various uh, um, security treaties, like heaven spoke, uh, worked to prevent uh, war for reunification and uh, for Taiwan, uh, protecting Taiwan streets and not uh, to allow invasion into Taiwan were a very important uh, uh, purpose of the security treaty. And uh, Chiang Kai-shek tried to approach Soviet Union, uh, looking at uh, the uh, confrontation between China and uh, Soviet Union. Union and uh, uh, Taiwan tried to approach uh, uh, Soviet Union. And so unification, reunification may, might have been a bigger agenda uh, for divided uh, nations. Uh, then uh, from that point, point of view, what is the significance of San Francisco's peace treaty and the development uh, initiative in S Southeast Asia? And those are the points we could uh, discuss. And in view of those different points and perspectives and the relationship between China lobby and their influence upon the formation of Japan ROC peace treaty negotiations, what I wrote in my essay in the book uh, is uh, the various uh, discussion and the uh, public opinions criticized uh, the defense uh, department ministry of the ROC, uh, saying that they were too near in the support of the United States. Of course, uh, uh, it was necessary to make some coordination in policies with the United States, but from the domestic point of view, there were so many dissatisfaction with uh, the ROC's government in their relationship with the United States. And at the end of the day, uh, in 1946, 1947, there were a lot of uh, uh, eagerness, but uh, when uh, the Communist Party began to consider unification uh, uh, in around 48 and 49, uh, the government moved to Taipei. Uh, around that, there was so uh, different situation, and um, uh, it was uh, a negotiation like uh, Japan was as if a victorious uh, nation. Of course, the uh, ROC uh, tried to say what they wanted, but after all, uh, they ended up having uh, a treaty similar to San Francisco Treaty. And so uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, tried to uh, deal with uh, the reality in ROC. And of course, uh, they spoke for what they had to, but after all, they had to follow something like uh, the San Francisco Peace Treaty. And a legislative one or had a more tougher line of discussion and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in ROC had to uh, follow a more soft approach because they knew the reality vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And through China lobby, uh, they have worked, tried to work on uh, the Japan ROC peace treaty to get the better conditions, uh, but there were limitations to what China lobby can do vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And ROC's uh, uh, desires were not uh, met. Of course, there was a large framework, and they, uh, there should be no agreement which are uh, deviating from uh, the image framework. And Chiang uh, Kai-shek, uh, of course, uh, in a sense, uh, had to conform with the San Francisco Treaty. Otherwise, they couldn't be regarded as a victorious uh, nation. Regarding Okinawa and uh, China's uh, insistence on territorial claim of Okinawa, First, as a very important premise, at the time of Cairo Declaration, Roosevelt uh, said many things about Okinawa to Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, in FRUS, what is carried there uh, was uh, established in 1950s, and it's really difficult to use that document. Around that time, FRUS, when that was uh, uh, prepared by United States, uh, they couldn't uh, confirm the contents and they uh, talked with uh, Taiwan whether they could uh, have such and such understanding. And Roosevelt, uh, many times, uh, many times 
uh, times after many times uh, questioned uh, Shankar Sheikh about Okinawa. That was uh, in the writing. Uh, Shankar Sheikh at the time uh, was at odds with Son Shibun. And so uh, one uh, Choke and so Bile were the only one which was sent to the negotiation. And uh, there were uh, very little documents concerning Karo declaration in the diplomatic documents of ROC. And regarding the uh, draft of uh, the treaty, it was sent to Chongqing, uh, but the secretary of uh, Shen Kai-shek didn't uh, forward this to Shen Kai-shek. Uh, so, uh, there were uh, no um, uh, documents uh, concerning uh, the draft uh, peace treaty. It's after all, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs have to ask uh, Shang Kai Shek what was going on. Uh, but what the Shang Kai Shek was able to read is the Chinese translation by So Bire or Wang. So in the 1950s, FRUS, which were more or less. Uh, 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 written uh, by Shen Kai-shek, to what extent that can be relied, I have a question. Uh, in early 1950s or in uh, the late 1940s, the society in ROC considered that Okinawa is a territorial claim issue, but Shen Kai-shek itself, himself, uh, we do not know whether he really considered Okinawa as a major uh, point of discussion and uh, for uh, Korea and independence was sought after, but uh, Ryukyu was not a part of the China's history, so it would not be treated like uh, uh, Taiwan uh, or Chengfu. But of course, Chen Kai-shek later looked upon what he earlier mentioned, and so if uh, Okinawa was to be placed under uh, the um, trusteeship uh, by Okinawa, uh, then uh, Taiwan also wanted to join that trusteeship, but that was uh, rejected by MacArthur. And uh, what they c insisted is not Okinawa, but the Senkaku Island as a territorial claim issue. And uh, that remark, however, uh, was supported only by one person. And so I have to say that on the ROC's government level, Okinawa's uh, insistence on territorial claim of Okinawa was rather uh, weak, although that might be high among uh, the public opinion. Uh, so rather than Okinawa, uh, South China Sea uh, might have been considered more important as a territorial issue as uh, on the part of Soviet Union, Return of Okinawa to uh, Japan was mentioned, but the Chinese Communist Party considered Okinawa as uh, a part of uh, uh, Japan, and the uh, Chinese Communist Party was saying this uh, more than uh, the uh, Taiwan's uh, party. Thank you. Professor Kusunoki, please. Thank you. I think I received a very comprehensive question together with a specific question about each presentation. And one of the question, how I evaluate uh, the Yoshida's capability as a diplomat and what Japan could and could not achieve through the peace settlement. This is what I would like to discuss. Perhaps if it were not Yoshida, assuming that the Japan was under the Conservative Party's rule, another person other than Yoshida could have taken a different uh, direction any person would have accepted the stationing of U.S. forces in Japan because this is closely linked to the peace settlement. It would have been quite difficult for Japan to try to uh, deny 
the stationing of the U.S. forces unless Japan decided not to take the option of the majority of peace. In case Japanese government or Japan decided to decline the peace settlement approach proposed by U.S., I think it could, have, it could have been a serious issue for U.S. because for U.S. it was in U.S. interest to settle peace and uh, now that the, the reforms under the occupation was almost completed, so the justification for keeping the occupation forces in Japan was very much compromised. So U.S. seriously would have needed peace settlement if Japan strongly demanded the overall peace settlement. I think the gradual recovery of the sovereignty was already happening coming into 1950s and the state of war. Perhaps a country available would have declared the end of war uh, with Japan and post-war Japan would have been started and uh, it would have been quite difficult to justify the stationing of the U.S. forces uh, in Japan and it would have been easier for China to intervene in Japanese situation. Acceptance of the majority peace settlement by Japan at that time did define the course for Japan onward. How do I evaluate Yoshida? What are the characteristics of him as to the rearmament? Yoshida did not like the proposal from US. Yoshida is quite reluctant about rearmament of Japan. This was Yoshida's feature. What could have happened if Yoshida strongly demanded rearmament? We don't know. This is an interesting issue. Concerning the peace settlement, acceptance of the peace settlement for Yoshida and the, the complete obedience of the treaty is what Japan should do. This is clearly stated by Yoshida, and Yoshida did that. And that should be positively evaluated. Although Japan maintained a difficult relationship with the countries which were not signatory to the treatment, but the adherence to the treatment, a treat treaty, was what Yoshida did. Among conservative party members, there was a faction which were against this uh, settlement system. For example, this comfort about the absence of return of, of Okinawa or loss of the southern Karakuto, and also there were a strong criticism within the conservative camp as to the station. In 1951, in 1952, uh, a different conservative party called the Reformist Party wanted to revise the San Francisco Peace Treaty, but Yoshida did abide by the provision of the San Francisco Treaty. This is what we should evaluate positively. As to the stability of the Japan-US security, we have to look at 1950s as a total. Hubs and spokes, unlike Hubs and spokes, to what level US was serious about, about comprehensive regional security system? I have a lot of doubts although it is constantly mentioned in the policy documents. So we have to think about how we should evaluate the seriousness of the U.S. about the comprehensive regional security system. As to the stationing of the U.S. forces 
uh, in the States, when it became an important pillar of the security system, depending on the characteristics of basis or the depending on the international situation, comprehensively, we need to analyze that issue. So I can say thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sunoki. And I'd like to open the floor for discussion. Uh, first, uh, we received the four questions uh, from online participants. And after uh, having responses to those questions, I would like to uh, raise uh, to see whether the participants on site have any questions. Uh, please allow me to appoint who is going to answer which question. Now, uh, question number one is from Osawa. Uh, what should, how should we view Cold War in East Asia? When did it begin and when did it end in East Asia? Uh, may I turn to Professor Kusunoki and Dr. Kawashima? Uh, Dr. Kawashima, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a difficult question. At uh, first, it depends upon the definition of the Cold War, but from the general understanding, uh, in uh, Europe in 1947 is often mentioned as an year, uh, but uh, the uh, Chinese Civil War, was it part of the Cold War? That's a difficult question uh, to answer. Uh, Soviet Union recognized uh, PRC, uh, ROC. And, and under such circumstances, there was uh, the uh, Chinese uh, civil war, and many scholars uh, mentioned there were some Cold War characteristics in the Chinese civil war, but uh, the real uh, Cold War in East Asia began with the Korean War, its breakout. But a more of a question is as follows. Uh, toward the end of Cold War era, a recent discourse and discussion goes as follows. And as I mentioned by Professor Kichi Fujibara in 1970s in East Asia, and the Cold War in East Asia uh, changed dramatically. Uh, Taipei and Japan severed the diplomatic relations, and Japan resumed the diplomatic relations with PRC in 1979. United States severed the diplomat diplomacy with Taiwan. So in the field of diplomacy, uh, there uh, were such changes. And of course, the same could have been said about U Europe, but uh, in East Asia, uh, going beyond uh, the East and West blocks, uh, diplomacy was uh, uh, concluded, and uh, uh, two nations uh, have a relationship with uh, Taiwan. But of course, uh, maintaining culture and economy in the field of security, uh, although the uh, exploration of uh, security relations with the uh, uh, PROC, uh, uh, they began to uh, put and uh, for the security of Taiwan Straits. Uh, in 1981, the end of Cold War, uh, there was a big retreat of the power of Soviet Union and the Taiwan and uh, uh, Korea began to have a lot of uh, interaction. And in the 1970s, a big change took place and that continues from 1981 up to today. And what changed in 1970s uh, and in 2020s today is uh, changing. And that is uh, around the changes of the situation of circumstances over the Taiwan Straits. Uh, thank you very much. And now, uh, Professor Kusunoki, uh, that might be a difficult question for Japan, but what is the uh, Cold War for East Asia and Cold War for Japan? That's a difficult question. Uh, I have difficulty responding. Uh, but Cold War in East Asia. Uh, some say that it begin it began in Japan or began with the division of the Korean Peninsula or with uh, China. Uh, but it really depends upon how we characterize what is called the Cold War. And also the Cold War itself is more or less uh, depend upon the people's perception. It uh, uh, may uh, be uh, born in the perception of people. When I talk about public perception, there could be a more diverse ways of interpreting at the beginning and the end of the Cold War. So I don't think I can be clear in my response. But in relation to the uh, Treaty of uh, Peace system with Japan, uh, Japanese government, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, 
uh, when I look at their preparation for the Treaty of Peace with Japan uh, in the Chinese Civil War, uh, Kuomintang uh, was uh, uh, losing and the Communist Party it may win and it may lead to the formation of PRC. And it uh, made the Foreign Affairs, uh, the Ministry of Japan, uh, to uh, see non-possibility of general uh, overall peace. So what would be China uh, like? Uh, and that assessment made a very important impact upon the approach and decision by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Question from Yokoyama to perhaps Professor Hatano. San Francisco of Peace Treaty or the ROC Japan the Peace Treaty, uh, the provision uh, they cover the fishery or trade issues. Why, why was it? Uh, Hatano, please. As the Professor Kusunoki mentioned in the paper, peace settlement or the peace treaty system did have, usually there was a five years, usually like the case of Italy, immediately after the end of the war, the peace treaty is concluded within two years. But in the case of Japan, there was a period of five years. In fact, a virtual of peace was there so that the economic and the trade and the personal exchanges in a small way were being restarted according to the Potsdam Declaration so that the virtual of peace was being realized. It's same for the fishery. Uh, these are not directly related to the post-war handling, but in the process for Japan's return to the international society, uh, these issues like uh, people's movement, economic activities, like uh, trade or the fishery or civil aviation, uh, the track record was already there to support the Japan's return to the internet society, trying to use the peace settlement with the treaty as a kind of support. That's why I think uh, these, the reason why these uh, the treaties have those provisions. Professor Kusunoki, I know this is an interesting issue. I'm afraid I was not able to see all aspects of the San Francisco Peace Treaty. I have not covered issues like uh, fishery or trade. Within the Western countries, there was uh, an economic order needed to be established. And uh, these provisions, I believe, are quite important to support international order about economies, UK and uh, Commonwealth countries wanted to restrict Japanese economic activities. But rather than that, the, at the basis of the free economic order, I think these provisions were effective. Thank you very much. Next. Uh, two questions to Prof. Dr. Kawashima. One is from Fan Son Min san. Uh, PRC uh, today uh, emphasized uh, the uh, Cairo and uh, uh, Potsdam Declaration, and uh, uh, ROC also emphasized uh, the independence and sovereignty. How uh, can the two sides uh, agree with each other? And second question uh, is from Osawa um, uh, to uh, Dr. Kawashima, and if possible, um, PRC's attitude uh, to Okinawa, was there any influence by Tokugawa? 
the QEG. Could you elaborate on the question? Two questions to Professor Kawashima. Uh, no, a recording. Uh, I'd like to mention an answer on ROC, Japan Peace Treaty. In that treaty, uh, trade and fishing and commercial relations were all written. Between Japan and Taiwan, uh, uh, Japan Taiwan commercial uh, agreement uh, was assigned in 1950 when Japan was not independent. Uh, on behalf of uh, Japan, GHQ uh, concluded such an agreement, and trade was uh, specified in that uh, agreement. And part of such a agreement was uh, uh, carried on, and uh, Japan before its independence uh, concluded the uh, treaty with the ROC. And based upon uh, the Japan-Taiwan uh, trading agreement, what was to be done was uh, uh, a very important question. And the question from uh, uh, Fang San. Taiwan's uh, legal status uh, are not determined. Uh, uh, Pescadori Island was uh, uh, raped, uh, and the when when that is attributed to is uh, not uh, determined. And Ando Rikichi uh, uh, returned the territory to uh, Taiwan, but there were four big powers behind Li Qingyi, and uh, China was receiving this on the behalf of uh, Allied powers. So the status uh, of Taiwan was undetermined, and that was the rationale behind the uh, separation of uh, uh, sovereignty of our independence of our uh, Independence of Taiwan and PLC's uh, arguments, uh, how can these two uh, come to terms with each other? Uh, perhaps uh, uh, there were no possibility of coming to terms with uh, each seems to apply uh, their own interpretation. Um, from the legal point of view, it's difficult to see any um, agreement between the two parties. But if any discussion is possible, there could be the following uh, proposition. In the peace treaty with Japan, uh, Japan waived uh, the uh, rights over Taiwan and uh, Pescadori. But in uh, the Japan PRC uh, ROC uh, peace treaty, uh, Japan signed uh, on the premise that uh, ROC was an independent state. And so uh, in reality, um, uh, Japan recognized the unification ROC was an independent state and uh, signed uh, the treaty with ROC. So with that fact, can we say that uh, ROC was uh, ruling over the Formosa? And so that was one of the things I could derive from the history. And Osama-san, thank you for the question. But uh, that's one interpretation. And Dr. Shiroyama uh, and Hokkaido University and others look at a communist uh, or PRC. Uh, incorporate Tokuda's argument and within the Communist Party of China, Okinawa and should be a part of uh, China. And uh, Tokuda's opinion was uh, uh, incorporated, and that was uh, referred to in various uh, researches in the past. And so uh, the primary uh, materials are not disclosed uh, uh, at all, so it's uh, difficult uh, to answer the question. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kawashima. Now, using the time available for us, we would like to receive a question or comment from participants on site. Please use a microphone. Uchii, a member of a group studying the issue of Takeshima, Uh, the Professor Nishimura mentioned about uh, Professor Hatano's comments about uh, the, the wartime laborer. I think the key word is decolonization, thinking about uh, 
what's happening in South Korea. If we are going to take the framework of decolonization, we'll be able to understand it better. The concept of decolonization concerning other former colonies. This concept, is it applicable? In a way, it is being used by South Korea. This is my question. In South Korea, the fundamental aspect is that the, the, the South Korea could not be the signatory to San Francisco. Uh, when the draft was presented in 1951, uh, the, and uh, the South Korea demanded uh, the sovereignty over Tsushima, uh, and this request was made to UK uh, because uh, the Soviet Union took uh, part of the Northern Ireland. So as an allied country, uh, South Korea demanded Tsushima and this was rejected according to uh, UK documents. And the, the South Korea wanted to be one of the allied countries when it made that request. In 51, in October, uh, the preparatory meeting started. Then in the next year, the full meeting started with Korea. And the, the South Korea uh, presented uh, the draft of the treaty in which uh, it said that the Korea recognizes Japanese independence. And uh, it also had a provision that the, uh, there has been no uh, Japanese is, uh, the subject uh, on Korean Peninsula because uh, the, the Korean Korea uh, remained independent throughout. So thinking about the current situation, Korea, South Korea would like to, is making uh, Japan to recognize South Korea as a genuine member of the allied powers. So uh, the, the South Korea is demanding Japan to uh, review its historical view because South Korea believes that it is one of the most important member of the allied forces in terms of the contribution to the uh, World War II. If this is the, uh, the concept held by the South Korea, I think this is not the decolonization. This is the denial of the existence of the colonial system. And I don't know whether this concept in South Korea will be accepted internationally. Professor Hatano, could you respond to the question? I know this is a very big issue. Thank you for the question. I thought that this kind of question would come to me. For Republic of Korea, when the country talks about the decolonization, although Korea was under the Japanese colonial rule, but the Korea, South Korea always maintained its legal legitimacy. So after the war, South Korea should be regarded as one of the victorious countries. And uh, South Korea wanted to establish its position as one of the winning countries and wanted to demand uh, the reparation based on that status. That background, uh, the for South Korea during the period of the Japanese colonial administration, legitimacy of the, the Korean administration was never compromised. Decolonization for other countries is quite different for South Korea when that nation considers the perception. Because of this perception, that perception held by South Korea, can it be 
applied to other countries or did it have any impact on other countries' process toward independence? I don't think so. I think that the situation of the South Korean uh, decolonization was so particular, peculiar, particular to South Korea. And as I mentioned in my presentation, there is something quite specific when we think about the South Korean demand to recognize individual compensation. It's not about the legitimacy based on the international laws. Treaties or the agreement among the states are not the basis for the demand of the individual compensation. It's more to do the illegitimacy or illegality of the colonial rule, which becomes the basis of the claim to individual compensation. That seems to be the background in South Korea. Thinking about other cases, other colonies by the European powers, after the end of the colonial rule, the colonization process started in those countries. But the process for South Korea seems to be quite peculiar, quite particular to that particular state. Thank you very much, Dr. Hatano. Uh, from the viewpoint of uh, my area expertise on the United Kingdom, uh, in the British Commonwealth, uh, the past uh, slavery trade or uh, massacres, uh, demands for uh, compensation uh, are being raised. Uh, Korea is not conscious of those uh, trends, and directly or indirectly, the uh, UK, France, and the Dutch colonial rule, uh, I think, are being affected today. And this might destabilize the foundation of the present international law. Uh, ROK perhaps is not mindful of such uh, movements as they are looking only toward Japan. In that sense, the global conundrum of uh, decolonization, which is not limited to Japanese colonial rule, uh, is what it means. Uh, the foundation of so West Faria uh, regime itself is uh, being destabilized. This is a gigantic uh, problem. And uh, without mindful of such trends, uh, ROK uh, is uh, demanding uh, repatriations from Japan, and this uh, might be a source of destabilization of the international order. Uh, I'm sorry for uh, making my own comments. Uh, Perhaps uh, we can accept one more question, please. Thank you for wonderful presentation. I'm Nakanishi Graduate School of Law School of Doshisha University. I have a question to Professor Hatano. Uh, you talk about the issue of wartime labor uh, in Korean Peninsula and uh, thinking about the issue of awareness about the history in East Asia. In Western countries, importance, I'm afraid that the weakness of Japanese diplomacy is a lack of capability to understand the importance of the human rights issue. Thinking about the diplomatic histories of 1970s, Concerning the issue of refugees from uh, in the China area, Japanese government was quite reluctant. And uh, Mr. Ohira, Prime Minister, visited US. And at that time, uh, the, the members of the Congress demanded uh, Prime Minister Ohira to deal with the human rights issues. I have to say that the lower uh, priority of the human rights issues uh, in the Japanese diplomacy back in 1917. But this may be still true today. We see confrontation between the US and China. In order to get support for Japan, it's quite important to have a common uh, value system with the Western countries. 
I'm afraid that uh, this weakness of the Japanese with human capability of not dealing with uh, the human rights issues seriously uh, may be a lethal weak point. When the peace treaty is was concluded, and the, it talks about the, the adherence to the Universal Declaration of the Human Rights, as a philosophy, the respect of the human rights is important part of the Japanese diplomacy, both post-war and pre-war uh, Japanese diplomacy, although the forms may be different. In Japan, human rights, rather than universal rights, uh, that should be available to everybody. The concept of human rights in Japan is more like uh, rights supported by uh, legal systems. In the process up to the peace treaty the, and its settlement, and the rule of law or the, the, the basis in the international law system are the one of the characteristics of the Japanese diplomacy. Japanese diplomacy always tended to focus on details of the international law system. And it's same, it was the same for the human rights and the diplomacy concerning the human rights. So not as a universal value, human rights. I'm afraid that the universal coverage of the human rights all over the world is not well accepted in the Japanese diplomacy. Dr. Hatono, thank you very much for answering a difficult question. Unfortunately, it's time to close uh, the discussion and also the symposium. I'd like to once again thank all the speakers. And of course, I'd like to uh, return the microphone to Mr. Akua. Uh, Dr. Hosoya, thank you very much for having moderated the session. The speakers and the uh, uh, International Research Center for Japanese Studies, the uh, uh, co-organizer, and all the participants on site and online, thank you very much. Now, uh, Mr. Ozaki, uh, Director of Research Coordination, uh, is going to give us the closing remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, although this is Saturday, I thank you very much for having taken part in the uh, symposium. And I do thank you very much for your really high level of uh, interest till the very end of the discussion. And thank you very much for your comments and questions. Uh, in this uh, symposium, we had a very significant and uh, meaningful discussion concerning the San Francisco Treaty of uh, Peace with Japan. Uh, all the speakers and our co-organizer, Nichi Bunken, and all the audience, uh, we were able to have a discussion from uh, multiple perspectives. I'd like to thank all of you uh, for your kind of participation and your contribution. Now, regarding uh, the activities of uh, JIIA, uh, including uh, today's symposium, you, we are uh, uh, continue to disseminate and, uh, uh, information through our homepage, website, and SNS. Once again, I'd like to thank you, uh, both uh, uh, online and uh, on-site participants, for your kind attention. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ozaki. I have two announcements to make. Regarding the symposium, uh, we are asking uh, you to fill out the questionnaire. I think the on-site participant has given a sheet of a questionnaire. Uh, I hope that you have time to fill out the questionnaire and please submit the form uh, at uh, uh, the exit. And also for online participants, you'll be able to find the questionnaire uh, in the screen. And uh, in order for us to, uh, to program uh, future events, uh, I would like to ask for your kind cooperation in filling out the questionnaire. And uh, please return the simultaneous and the pleasure receivers uh, at your exit. Uh, now we would like to conclude this uh, symposium on San Francisco peace settlements and East Asia uh, contemporary perspectives. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.